From Field Pass Hockey Southern Command, this is the Inside the SPHL Podcast. Here is your host, James Hayes. Welcome to this week's episode of Inside the SPHL. It's uh, It's been a couple of weeks. I figured I'd come back and circle back and uh, talk to you guys about some stuff because I know you guys love to hear me talk. But uh, no, in reality, I finally got another guest. Uh, off-season guests are tough to come by, but I got a good one for you this week, and I hope you guys enjoy it. And uh, so let's let's jump right in. So he had a 17-year professional career in, in uh, playing hockey. He was a goaltender. He spent time in the FPHL, the SPHL, the CHL, the ECHL, and the AHL. He won the championship with the Watertown Wolves in the FHL back in 1415. And uh, last November, after hanging up his skates, he took on a whole new uh, approach to hockey and became the second head coach of the Vermilion County Bobcats. And so if you don't know who it is yet by now, he is now, this year, found a new home in Macon as the new head coach of the Macon Mayhem. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you guys to Nick Nieder. Nick, how you doing, man? All right, Bears are one and zero. Packers are zero and one. I just wanted to remind you of that. <laughs> Dang it, man! How are you going to do that to me? Just right <laughs> off the bat. So, 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 no thank you for coming on the show. I'm not going to thank you at all. But uh, yeah, so the wins will be few and far to come by. So you know what? Enjoy it while I can. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it. It was rough for the Packers. I don't know. I don't know if. The, Aaron Rodgers is always going to tell everybody to calm down, but ah, that was rough, man. That was yeah, rough. He's done it before. He'll be okay. That's, that's right. Until the playoffs, he'll have a great, you know, MVP season, and then he'll choke in the playoffs. But uh, good thing he doesn't listen to this podcast because he no. got him there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm there. It's yeah all right. that's right. But uh, but anyways, no. Thanks for coming on. I mean, uh, it's uh, it's been uh, it's been an interesting off season across the league. Those three head coach vacancies, and your name was yeah. popping around with all three. Of, well, two of them, anyways. And uh, and you landed in Macon, so we'll lead off with that, and and we'll kind of backpedal. We'll do this in reverse. And so, how did that really uh, come about? Were you were you looking to get back into coaching uh, heading into this season? I was, but not to the head coaching aspect. Um, I talked to a handful of teams about joining as an assistant, um, you know, and then this opportunity came around, um, you know, obviously it's late in the season and um, the assistant coaching opportunity was still on the table. And then after a few conversations, it turned, uh, it turned into the head possibility. Uh, then it, obviously brought on a different group of conversations. Um, I, uh, I started my career in Macon, actually the first uh, year of the Southern Professional Hockey League's existence. Um, the opening day I was playing for the Macon tracks, so it's kind of coming full circle. Yeah. Um, but no, I spoke to them a little bit in July when uh, Zach was the head coach there. Obviously they agreed to, part ways and then um you know the tone changed and the interview part changed and you know the questions were a little different you know because two different job titles right and um then we worked out uh that maybe this is gonna be the best thing for both parties and decided that uh why the heck not this was a fresh start and it's extremely late you know, Clarky and I got the jobs uh, when he, with him in Knoxville, you know, a few days apart, maybe maybe a week or so. And then uh, uh, TJ was hired in Vermilion a couple weeks before uh, we both were. So yeah. obviously, yeah, there's been some change. But, you know, just like the ECHL, there's, I think there's eight or nine, maybe even, I think it might have been, been up to 11. Uh, new coaches, you know, in, this season, and it's all happened pretty late. So, um, you know, it's one of those read and react right. sports, and <laughs> I guess you have to do it at all, all yeah. aspects of the game. So, um, but it's been good, and you know, I'm excited. I went down there, spent a week there last week, um, just checked out the lay of the land, checked out the housing, worked with uh, Anna Marie, the general manager. Um, in regards to ordering uh, equipment, 
bus schedules, you know, you name it, we crammed it in, and, you know, the five days that I was there. So uh, looking forward to getting back down there in October and, um, you know, getting right into training camp with a fresh team. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I see you've already added some veteran leadership to the team. You got uh, brought Caleb Cameron back. I know that the Macon fans are excited about that. He's he's just an awesome guy on and off the ice. And then you also uh, brought in uh, David Nippert, who I – I had a little bit of uh, experience with down in Birmingham last year. Yep. And so, I mean, uh, you jumped with that early on and, and the, the signings are coming and Hey, good thing for you, right. Is there's three teams that are looking for players that kind of were the coaching situation was in limbo. Right. So that, that, that kind of makes it easier. Does it or no? Or am I just crazy? No, <laughs> no, no, <I'm> crazy. <laughs> uh, no, because there's so many guys that are signed that are starting out in the ECHL. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, within this league and now it's you know and those teams then recruited more players because they're technically on your team but they're not there so they don't know what's nobody knows what's going to happen um the other issue is there was a lot of players signed when i took this job i got you and now i'm adding my pieces to it and we're getting close to having almost too many guys. Um, But again, at the end of the day, especially this year, I don't care what your resume is. If you come to camp out of shape, you're not going to stick. If you come to camp entitled, you're not going to stick. You come complacent and okay with things, you're not going to stick. And it doesn't matter who it is. Yeah. I don't care. You know, the attitude of the team needs to change. The being okay with collecting a paycheck and living in the South and playing free golf all year just to get the results that you're not looking for on Friday and Saturday, don't have time for it. And I know the organization doesn't have time for it. The fan base is tired of it, and things need to change, and things are changing. Well, that's, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. I mean, I'm sure Macon fans are happy. I mean, Macon, the, people forget, you know, the Mayhem, they, they, they have a lot, had a lot of success in their history. They, uh, they, they're a very solid te- team in the past. And last year was a rough year for the team, but the fan base is very passionate. And so, I, I mean, that's, that's good to hear. No nonsense coming into the season. So that'll be, uh, that, that's a good thing for people to look forward there. So what's uh what's the playing style? What what kind what's what's I guess the culture of the team? What's your what's your identity that you want the team to be? I mean, the, you know, you got guys, you know, run and gun teams and defensive minded teams. What what kind of culture is, is your plan to bring in there? I want to have a hard working physical team. Um, you know, like I said, it's going to be tough to find top end talent right now. Right. Um, you know because. You know, the other teams have gotten a head start on that, which is fine. I mean, every team has top-end talent. Some teams' top-end talent is a lot higher than other teams' top-end talent. But we're going to be very tough to play against. We're going to be annoying to play against um, because we will be physical and we are going to work hard. In all three zones, we are going to work hard because if we don't have that top-end skill – what are you going to have, right? You have to have hard work. Um, the work ethic, I understand it is a subjective, you know, character, but, you know, we're going to have to have the work ethic there because we're not going to have those guys that are, you know, 80, 90 point guys that you've seen in the past where a lot of other teams do have it. But we have to have accountability, and that's going to be our biggest asset because if we have accountability, we will have work ethic. If we're accountable in all three zones, the work ethic will be there because our accountability will be there. Uh, The teams that aren't very successful don't have accountability, whether it's in the locker room, it's from the top down, it doesn't matter. Um, Players are going to have to be held accountable this year, and – that's going to be the biggest thing that's going to turn the uh, ship around because when they were very successful, um, coach uh, Kevin Kerr was the head coach there. He was running the ship 
And he held his players accountable, and that's why they were successful. He demanded a lot out of his players, and that's why they were successful. And, um, you know, that's that's what we're going to need this year. And, um, you know, it's going to be in the dressing room. Uh, that's why I went out and reached out to a player like David Nippard. You know, he's got great ter- character. He holds guys accountable. And he works his end, rear end off because – that's what he wants to do. He wants to be successful. He wants the team to be successful, but he's one of those. He doesn't care. He just wants to win. And I don't care if he hurts feelings, holding people accountable. Um, we're here to get a job done and do the job. And, you know, that's going to be a big driving force with the team this year. Well, good deal. Good deal. It sounds like I'm getting excited. Just looking forward to the season from that. I mean, it's uh and that's definitely a thing I, I, that I think a lot of people kind of don't, don't realize is is there is some occasions on teams at all levels of, of professional hockey where you can the, the team might just not be taking things serious and they might just kind of you know and it's sometimes late in the season and everybody's just kind of you know eh, we're just here to play and and uh, I mean you, you're professionals it may not be the NHL but it's the Southern Professional Hockey League right so so yeah. I I definitely see where you're coming from on that and and like I said, I look forward to that part of uh, – I look forward to seeing what this team looks like whenever uh, you guys get rocking and rolling out there. So, well, I mean, any team is only as good as their character and their leadership. Yeah. You know, the best teams at the end of the year have the best character. They have the best leaders. You know, everybody can skate. Everyone can shoot. Everyone can pass for the most part. Um, but your character guys write the ship. And, yeah. you know – realistically all the coaches are teaching the same thing it's just how the players respond to it you know you're all trying to win games that's what you're doing every night you're trying to have the same outcome every all 11 teams all you know 200 plus players all 11 coaches all 11 owners you know they want the same things it's just a matter of what happens in the locker room and what happens on the ice and what happens away from the locker room with those players? You know, that's that's the big difference. The tightest teams are the winning teams. You know, that's all there is to it. And looking forward to having good character, good culture, and uh, a lot of accountability in our locker room. Good deal. That uh, that's definitely that's definitely a promising news for all you Mayhem fans out there listening to to hear that uh, that coming from from your new coach. Let's uh let's jump back. Let's jump into your playing career a little bit. I feel like we've kind of we've talked a little bit about coach. Well, actually, before we do that, let me talk about your first season coaching. Um, we don't. We, it was uh, obviously. I mean, we all know that the the win column wasn't good. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna beat you up on that, even though you you know the Bears are one and zero. But <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but um but you I mean can't so do any more damage that's already been done right. <laughs> So, so, I mean, you came into that and, and it was, uh, you know, the season had already kind of got going. So you were already kind of in a bad spot. So you should be used to kind of getting, get, taking these coaching jobs in short notice. I don't know what you're worried about. At least you got a little bit of off season to deal with here. Yeah. So you, you inherited a team there. And, uh, so just kind of, I just give me a brief rundown of, of your first year, uh, coaching experience. Um, obviously there were a lot of changes in the front office. Before I got there, there was some coaching changes, and um, I took the job beginning of November. Um, it was tough because, first off, we didn't have a trainer until January, mm. which, I mean, how are you going to expect guys to do certain things in practice or compete a certain way when, you know, their safety's, you know, a bit of an issue? Yeah, um, we had trainers for games, but not for practice every day. We didn't have the, you know, the amenities in the locker room at the time. Uh, Jason came in. They had a tough time finding a trainer, and Jason came in uh, right after Christmas, and um, he was remarkable, which that definitely helped. But you know, my first uh, four weeks were. 4D, three defensemen, nine forwards maybe, you know, if we were completely healthy. It was just we had three goalies get hurt in 
you know, my first two days there, um, it was not a good start to a season. Um, and the damage was done with, you know, some of the character and attitudes and, you know, then we started coming around, started coming around. We had a, we had a rough night again, Knoxville. Next day we came back, lost in overtime. Guys played great. Um, you know, so we got a, our first point and then we ended up beating Peoria in, uh, in overtime there right before Thanksgiving and things were, things were coming around, you know, and then, um, we started losing players. Yeah, you guys started, started getting, everybody was getting called getting, up. Yeah. We started getting picked <laughs> off and, yeah. um, you know, we led the league last year in that. Yeah. And I'm extremely proud of the guys for that, for, you know, having opportunity at the next level. Um, you know, that was a big thing. This is a development league. You know, we're developing players for the next level. We're developing people. And fortunately, the organization was able to develop players to get opportunities at the next level because at the end of the day, the ECHL is the highest a lot of these guys are ever going to play. And the American League is definitely the highest that guys in this league are going. Um, Kaspersky, he went up to the American League last year. Um, Joe Murdaka got uh, picked up in the American League um, last season as well. That was our property. Um, you know, it was it was tough because it was timely injuries and timely call-ups yeah. that did not go into our favor at all. They did yeah, not. It just doesn't seem like you ever had a full team to work with that you know like meshed a team that played together to work with nearly the whole season yeah and the thing was it wasn't we weren't making changes to make changes we were making changes to fill holes um because the season's so long and it's so tough to play shorthanded especially with a young team and the schedule did not help us in any way possible I think uh, 40 of our games were against Evansville, Quad, or Peoria. Yeah, and Peoria and Quad were having unbelievable seasons. Evansville had an up-and-down one, but, I mean, that yeah. playing two of the top four teams in the league almost every night, that's – that's that's what I was preaching to everybody last season too. I was on the side of the Bobcats. I was like, look. 20, <laughs> I think it was 28 games we yeah. played Quad or Peoria. Yeah, that's – what do you with the their veteran team? We had a very young team, and then at the end of the year, we got even younger with all of the college guys coming in. Um, you know, it was tough, you know, getting guys in trade, um, uh, trying to make the team better every day, you know, personnel on the ice. Um, obviously, I think you might have done something about some of our distractions at the arena you guys spoke about last year no that was uh that was somebody else okay. that was that was i uh, heard about it i didn't hear it i didn't listen to it yeah i didn't i, I heard, heard about it. i heard about it as well but uh I yeah that was that and, was uh, uh yeah there was a lot of like we didn't have ice for four weeks or three weeks last year because of you know their the uh festival that they had there which they do every year it's fine but you know, there was a lot of distraction yeah. last year and, you know, it started wearing on the guys and in turn, that'll happen with a roster, with a organization, you know, it's tough to, veteran guys can block out the noise a lot easier than younger guys. Right. Um, and we were so young that that was tough to do, but, um, you know, a lot of the guys there competed. I learned a lot about people that year. I learned a lot about people. Um, a lot of guys did compete hard. Um, a lot of guys moved up to the next level and were successful. A lot of guys got a taste of what it was like at the next level. And I expected them to come back a little more excited, you know, to see where their careers can go. 
you know, yeah. that's why I wanted all the guys to get called up at once at sooner or later in the season, because I want them to, to get to that highest level of players. They're going to play with, they're going to compete at the highest level. They're ever going to play with, um, you know, they're skating with guys that are NHL draft picks. They're skating alongside guys that are signed in the national hockey league, whether they're down because they made a mistake, um, the ownership or GM at the higher levels pissed off at them, whatever the case may be. But that is some of the best hockey that some of those guys are ever going to play. And I wanted everybody to experience it last year. And that's why I was pushing for my guys to go up. Um, because they, a lot of them, you know, at the time I thought a lot of them deserved it. A lot of those guys did. Um, looking back, would I have done some things differently? couple things. Um, but overall, I wouldn't have done a whole lot different. Um, you know, the like I said, my biggest thing last year, it was such a tough year right off the start. I wanted those guys, every single player to experience what, what it's like playing at the next level, you know, and it'll make them hungrier. It'll, it's good on a resume. Um, if those guys want to go to Europe, um, or whatever, right. Um, but just experience the highest level possible. And then you take that ceiling and you raise a little bit more. So instead of, hey, I played 15 games in the ECHL. Oh, that's not good enough. Now you want it to be 20. Now you want it to be 25. Now you want it to be 30. You want to be a goalie that's playing more than he's sitting on the bench. You know, whatever the case may be. Um, But I did. I wanted all my guys to be prepared for that. And I prepared them like they were at the next level. Um, Demanded a lot out of those guys, even though it was a short staff and a very short roster at times still demand as much as you can out of them to make them better players and to make them better people. And they're going to learn to battle adversity a heck of a lot better. And a lot of those guys that were with me last year, they grew up a lot and I'm very happy for them. Some of the others can't say the same thing, but um, you know, that was my biggest thing last year was trying to move players up and show them what it's like the next level, show them they can compete with it and come back here and, lead the right way for the younger guys that, you know, might get a chance to be at the next level. Yeah. So, and, and that's yeah. the goal. I mean, I don't know. And, and I mean, I, I love all the guys that play in the league, but I don't think any of these guys' intention is to be a career SPHL guy. I think the goal is always to play that next level and get as high as you can. So I don't think you could, I don't think you could ever be faulted for, for wanting your players to go up. I mean, it sucks for it sucks for the team if you're losing key pieces, but at the same time, it's it's great for the player because everything you just mentioned. So I, I, I don't mean, think it it does. It sucks at the time, but in retrospect, somebody else now instead of playing 14 minutes is playing 19 minutes. Guys are yeah. getting more opportunity when a guy goes up. Another guy's getting an opportunity, and then that that guy's going to be put in some tough situations. So now he's used to that situation. He's been in that situation before he knows what works, what doesn't. So, I mean, I wish some of the guys would have understood that a little bit better. Um, You know, Hey, maybe I didn't do a good enough job explaining it to him, you know, saying, Hey, this guy, we lost a guy. He's going up, you know, instead of saying, Oh, we just lost our best player. Say, all right, next man up mentality, you know, be the solution, be part of the solution. Don't be part of the problem. Be yeah, that solution. You gotta be hungry. <laughs> so you know that that was the biggest thing I wish uh could have been relayed a little bit better. And like you said, you know, I don't know how many guys want to be a career SPHL player, but in reality, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no. nothing wrong with that at all. But it's a good league. If you're gonna do that, don't be complacent about it. Don't be that guy at the end of the bar saying I could have, should have, would have done this. Right. You know, if that's what you're going to do, great. Show these young guys how to do it then. Yeah. I look at a guy like Alec Hageman when I think of that. You know, he's uh, he's just a staple in Peoria and he's been around forever. Yeah. And But he's a hell of a leader and he plays hard. It, it, 
exactly. And he's Every got that championship game. pedigree. <laughs> so, he plays hard. Yeah. Uh, Jean Guy, you know, does a hell of a job with their team, but Alec does the things in the locker room that keeps that team going in the right direction. He's a hell of a leader. Um, I saw him too much last year, <laughs> um, but he's a hell of a hockey player and he's a great leader and he demands a lot out of his teammates, but also at the same time he can, because look what he's doing. Right. You're putting up that many points and that many penalty minutes because you're playing hard. You're playing the right way. There's nothing wrong with that being your leader. Whatsoever. And the fact, and the fact that everybody outside of Peoria hates him as a fan base that means you got to be doing something right. Cause I always Absolutely. figure the most, the most hated guys outside of their fan bases are usually probably the best. ones. Oh, he's so. terrible to play against. Yeah. He's terrible to play against. I would hate it. But at the end of the day, every single team would want somebody like that on their team. Exactly. Exactly. Now you just got to find the making guy for that. Who's that going to be? We'll so. see. Yeah, exactly. I wasn't. That wasn't a real question. It was kind of a rhetorical question. It's not so. going to be a Hagman, but we're going to find something close. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, let's uh, let's jump into your playing career. So you got started playing back in 04, 05 in the SPHL, and yep. uh, you moved around a little bit. You said, like you said, you got started in Macon, and uh, and you played for two teams that don't even exist anymore. But uh, you have a perfect record with the Columbus Cottonmouths. So. That, that's a good one right that's there. That's good. Yeah, got then, that going for me. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, you were in Asheville with the Aces, and yeah. they still I still think they need to put a team back around there. That'd be cool. But uh, It was awesome. The town I, was great. I, I feel like I feel like that would be a good and it's 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 perfect for this league. But kind of tell me your first season. It was that was your first pro season, right? Yeah. So um, kind of walk walk me through that season. What was it like uh, after coming out of out of uh Playing before. Yeah, I played junior. Yeah. Um, it was it was great, and it was terrible at the same time because it was the first uh, first real lockout where it lasted all season, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so being a true rookie, that was tough. Um, and the other thing is when you play junior so long, you kind of, you think you have everything figured out. Right. But I found out rather quickly that, you know, just because, you know, you were a veteran in junior, that does not transpire into pro hockey. Um, I started out that year, um, Fort Wayne in the United league at the time. Um, storied franchise great franchise one of the best in minor pro hockey it's been around forever uh started there played in an exhibition um you know obviously didn't work out the lockout year i think there was <laughs> shoot 20 nhlers playing in that league yeah. that was the year where not everybody like in the NHL was looking average nhlers yeah national league players yeah. chelios hatcher smolinski like Every team was loaded. Barrett Jackman, uh, Jamal Mayers. Like, there were guys. Darren McCarty was playing. Like, uh, Kersey, I think, was playing for Flint at the time. The coach of Birmingham. I'm pretty sure he was in Flint. That sounds uh, right. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he was. He was He was a mean player. He was a good player, too. Man, he was a good player. Because I'm from down the road from uh, Quad. I live okay. an hour and a half from there, so their games would be on TV oh, okay. back home. So I watched him playing in some allergies and everything. So he was, yeah, he was, he was a good player. Kevin yeah. was a real good player. Um, but, you know, there was so much turnover that rookie year um, because all of a sudden players were starting to realize we're not going to play. I want to play. I'm going to go to the United League. And then the guys on the two-way deals, they wanted to play, so they were going to the American League. But it was taking some time, right? Like, it was just – it was very staggered because nobody really knew what was going on yeah. every day. Um, I think we were on the bus in uh, January 
we were uh, when I was playing for Asheville. I think we we're coming from. Um, we we're going from Fayetteville, I think, to Winston Salem, and we found there was a rumor that CBC, like it was about midnight, and a bunch of the guys' phones immediately started ringing, like everyone's phone started ringing. <laughs> it's like what the hell's going on? Yeah, we we're going to Winston because their equipment guy was sitting outside with a beer in his hand. I think he worked for Tampa Bay. I think he was going back to Norfolk or something. And he was sitting there and we pulled up and he's like, we found out right when we we're pulling into Winston and uh, they said, yeah, the lockout's going to be done. Everyone's going back tomorrow. Like he was just like, thank God. Yeah. And then it never, no, then remember the next day it was like, it never happened. Never like happened. something got pulled at the 12th hour. Like yeah. it was just, it was insane. So everyone was like on their phone with their agents where am I going? What am I doing? It was, it was a wild, wild bus trip. That's for sure. Cause everyone immediately who has battery on their phone, like it was, it was wild. Um, so there was a ton of movement that whole season. Um, and then, you know, finished up with Knoxville, um, lost to Columbus in the first round. We got swept. And then uh, Columbus went on to beat Macon for the championship that year uh, in 05. So it's been, uh, yeah, it was that was a long time ago. But, yeah, there was a lot of turnover. But everywhere, though, players, yeah. everything. Like, it was, what what it was a crazy, crazy, crazy year to to come pro. Your first year pro was the NHL lockout year. I mean. Not the best timing. <laughs> Crazy, crazy year. I think the the most the closest to that thing would have probably been uh, the COVID year for uh, guys in the SPHL because there was really no spots for them because all the ECHL guys were coming down and playing in the in the yeah. SP that year. So, but I don't know the lockout year. You had like you said, you had NHL guys playing, you know, down. So yeah, it was it was insane. There was yeah. a lot of uh, there was NHLers playing in the Central League. There was NHLers playing in the United League. Um, obviously the American league and the coast they were, yeah. they, it was loaded, right? Like hockey was great. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, Southern league, there was, there was some players there. There was a lot of ECHL experience in that league that year. That's for sure. Yeah. Cause those damn NHL guys were coming down. So the ECHL guys had to go down too. Right. Yeah. But even, <laughs> even my first, uh, three years, um, in the minors, I played in the SP and there was a lot more vets there was a lot more veterans. Um, you know, there was a lot more players with wives and kids and, you know, it was older. I mean, it might, might not have been older age wise, but it was because in major junior now you get your school package. So a lot of those 21 year old rookies, they're taking their schooling at CIS or whatever uh, in Canada or U sports, I guess it's called now. Yeah. But now it's, it's a different type of, it's a different younger guy. Like the first year guys are now 23, 22 to 25, you know, if they play junior and then they go to college after. So, you know, there was, there was a lot of guys that, you know, when I first started out, there was, there was a lot of older players, married guys. And, you know, there's kids in the locker room after games and stuff. It was hilarious. Or, you knew when they didn't have school, yeah. you'd see them, sitting in the lounge or whatever, but, um, yeah, it's definitely a lot different now. And, um, you know, just like society, everything's changed. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you spent, you had a lot, you played, I feel like you played almost everywhere in the SPHL, almost every team that doesn't exist anymore. I feel like you touched it. You, I mean, you, I was just looking, I forgot about the Florida seals. So you spent some time there, the, your following season, you were in Huntsville. Well, that's where make it moved. Okay. Make it moved to Florida. See, I, I, that, that far back in the SPHL, I'm not going to lie to anybody. I didn't, I didn't pay attention to the league because why would I? I had the CHL yeah. in Colorado. So. Yeah, five, uh, the Eagles. Oh my God, that yeah. was the toughest yeah. team in pro hockey. Yeah, that was, was that was probably that was probably top to bottom one of the scare, not scariest, but most physical, just tough teams. Yes, yeah. brutal. I loved yeah. it. 
I lived uh, I lived about 30 minutes from the rink whenever they showed up into the CHL and and I was ride or die with them all the way up and then they finally jumped to the AHL after I moved to Alabama so I yeah. didn't get a I didn't get to be there for that but uh but yeah the Eagles it, they still yeah. sell out every game they're still oh, yeah. tough they're still hard to play against yeah. awesome and, barn too oh yeah my old coach is there Tim oh. uh, Tim Branham he's there he was my assistant in Reading and the head in Utah he was he's He's got a good thing going there. He's a hell of a coach, so he yeah. deserves something like that. But Macon moved um, after uh, Dave Warnicker moved uh, the franchise down to Kissimmee, Orlando. They were there for, uh, I believe it was 5-6, and then the very beginning of 6-7, and then they disbanded, like, mid-season. Yeah. It was wild. You know, they uh, – yeah, they just – took off mid season. I remember that. That was that was a bit hectic, that's for yeah. sure. Only 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 in minor pro hockey will you see something like that happen, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, mid season it was tough. Yeah, you know, that's... I think Fresno Fresno did it I think one year in the ECHL. I'm pretty sure Augusta in the ECHL. And then Florida did it. And those are the only three that I can recall that did it mid season. Yeah, that's that's tough. And I mean Player, I mean, were you on the team when they disbanded, or were you already moved on to Huntsville at that point? No, I was in Huntsville. Okay, okay. I mean, I just imagine, and I'm sure you still had were in touch with those guys. I mean, I can only imagine what that's like for for players on that team. All of a sudden, you don't have anywhere to play. (laughs) Uh, Craig Miller and uh, Justin Keller, they joined our team um, after after Florida folded. I see. Those, Those two guys came up. Yeah. Well, that's that's good. At least at least some of them. But I mean, I just I don't know. That's that's insane. But but uh, but tell me about your time in Huntsville. You spent a couple of seasons there. You were there in uh, five, six and six, seven. And uh, tell tell me about that. I mean, what was Huntsville's another one of those storied franchises uh, that that winning is just part of their pedigree and kind of like making. Yeah. So, I mean, that that had to have been a, a good time out there. And then I was there again. I want to say uh, 12, 13. Let, let me tell you. Let me look it up. <laughs> I think. No, it was. Uh, yeah, 12, 13. You, they yeah. got you as their 12, 13. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was a weird situation because I just got let go in Reading <laughs> right at the roster freeze for playoffs. And I was living in Connecticut. I drove back to Connecticut. I just pulled in. And uh, Jordan Little, the assistant coach, called me. And he goes, we have a bit of an issue. So well, what is it? He said, we're on the bus and I forgot where they were going, but um, Dan McWinney is appendix blue. And he's like, we just bought your rights from Augusta. Um, saw you got released yesterday. Um, we need you to get down here as fast as you can because you have to dress tomorrow night to be eligible for the playoffs. And when I got released from Reading, we were in Fort Wayne. And um, the next morning, uh, it was a Wednesday when we were in Fort Wayne, Thursday, they were driving me to the airport. And um, my cab driver got T-boned. Like bad. (laughs) They got smoked. And I had to call the coach and be like, hey, missed my flight and he's like what do you mean i'm like sent him a picture of the cab i'm like we like we just got a wreck yeah and, you know so um flew back to reading and then i drove over to um connecticut that thursday night so yeah friday afternoon i found out and i'm like oh geez like you know what what the hell why not yeah. Got in my car, drove through the night, showed up for a morning skate Saturday. We had a quick optional and then dressed that Saturday night. And then I was on their playoff roster. We ended up losing in the finals in three to uh, Pensacola. Um, but yeah, that was my last year there. Uh, my first two years, it was awesome. I loved it. Mr. Jeffries did an unbelievable job uh, with the, you know, they rebranded. They were uh, the Channel Cats. Yeah. For all those years. And then my rookie year, um, 
they changed to the Havoc, and then I played for them the next year for John Gibson. Um, he traded me at the deadline to Florida to join basically the Macon team again with Cole staff, coaching staff, everybody was the same. And then um, in the off season, I signed with Huntsville and went back for, you know, the full season there. Um, unbelievable experience. Um, you know, they've built something so special there that it's, um, it's incredible what they've done with hockey and Huntsville. You know, yeah. it was, that was when it first started gaining momentum. And then they've gone through, I think uh, after Gibby, I think there's been three coaches until, you know, Glenn being there. I think there are three or four coaches. But now that Glenn has it, like that, his first year, they were okay. And then, you know, Glenn has his hand in that team, not his fingerprints, but he has his hand on it now. And to see them, then what him and Mr. Jeffries, the Jeffries family has done with Huntsville hockey for the years. It's just, it's incredible. It really is. It's incredible. And I'm extremely proud to be an alumni of that organization. And they do a lot of work with um, my coach there. Um, You know, they have uh, the legends weekend. There's huge. One of these years I need to be there for it. Um, You know, their alumni is a huge part of their, um, their culture and, the culture they have in the locker room on the ice, their tradition, you know, it's, it's a remarkable thing. They're one of those teams like a Knoxville, you know, that, and Huntsville, they set the bar. Yeah. You know, you have to be honest about it. They do. Um, yeah. And everyone's trying to have their own version of it, but those two teams have been around since the, you know, inception of the league and those organizations, they haven't changed a name. They haven't done anything. Um, you know, Quad Peoria, they haven't been around as long, but they're phenomenal organizations, not taking anything away from them. Uh, Fayetteville, phenomenal organization, not taking anything away from them. Um, but those guys have been doing it since day one. Yeah. Those, those two organizations have been doing it since day one and they do an incredible job. And, you know, the situation that I'm in right now with Macon, um, obviously we're not there yet. That's somewhere we want to go, but you know, you take a look at those teams and those organizations and that's what you try to mimic, have your own spin on it. But, you know, you're trying to make yourself like that. And, um, you know, we're not going to be there next week. We're not going to be there at the end of the season. It's going to take time. But um, that tradition, that attitude, that um, that style of player, that style of organization, that's what we're looking for. Yeah, definitely. That's yeah. I mean, that's that. Like you said, you said it. You said it well. I mean, they they set the bar for what an SPHL organization needs to look like. And I mean, the, like I, this league is a really good league. Last year was an incredibly good league, minus the bottom three teams. It seemed like, but uh, other than that, I mean, it was so competitive last year. It was, it was, it was a great league. I think a lot of these teams are starting to uh, starting to establish themselves, and 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 uh, and and it's it's fun. And I'm just hoping to see you guys bring Macon back up to uh, to that level where we all know the, the organization's been before. So <clears throat> excuse me there. But, um, but yeah, so let's talk. Um, let's see. Well, I don't think I've ever I haven't I haven't given you a chance really to talk about your ECHL time. You spent a lot of time in uh, in uh, reading, re- reading or reading. I don't remember. Reading. I, reading. There we go. Yeah. yeah reading. I'm an idiot. <laughs> Right. Pennsylvania. I know it's in Pennsylvania. There you go. So, <laughs> I have friends that go to their games all the time, and I screw it up. I, th- I do it on purpose to screw it up, you know. That's all right. But <laughs> but not today. Today I did it because I'm a dummy. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So you spent a lot of time there. Um, tell tell me about that. I mean, it seems like every season you kept kind of showing back up there in one one way or another. Is what was it about that place that that, that got you coming back all the time? Um great relationship with the staff uh coaching staff medical staff training staff great relationship with them um you know played against them for years Uh, when i was with elmira obviously played against them quite a bit um you know it just so happened that we were close by and um you know it's one of those situations where you know i got along well with the staff and the players and the organization that's um you know, so it was kind of a no-brainer, you know, go to camp with them and 
kind of see where it takes me. Um, if they needed me to play, I would. If they needed me to sit, I would. Um, you know, it's just it was a good good relationship back and forth. So let's let's talk about that a little bit about playing the goaltender position because you know a lot of these other guys you were talking about earlier getting called up you know I'm they're not getting the heavy minutes whenever they're forwards or defensemen but they'll get minutes but as a goaltender you get called up and I mean you can be up there for two weeks and just be opening and closing the door and and never getting out on the ice I mean how how does that affect your psyche and then whenever you go back down to the SPHL, they expect you to be the starter, but you've been sitting all this time. I mean, how do you, as a goaltender, how do you handle that? It's not easy. You know, the hardest part is getting released. And then when you come back down, if you don't have a day of practice under your belt before a game, it's it's tough just because of the pace of play. It's easier to, it's just like a car. It's easier to drive faster on the interstate than it is to drive at 25 through a neighborhood. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Like every, when you're at a high level, you know, you want the game to slow down. That's just the way it is. You want the game to slow down so you can have your own spin on it, but it's a different situation. It's hard to explain. It's a, it's, it's definitely a different situation. Um, no, it's not, it's not easy, you know, being up there and just kind of sitting there and kind of waiting your turn, waiting your turn. Um, but it's easier once you practice with the team more and more because then you start earning your respect to your teammates, right? And then at the end of the day, it's not your coach on the ice with you. It's your teammates on the ice with you. And if your yeah. teammates have faith in you, who cares if the coach has faith in you or not? It doesn't matter. Your peers do. And your teammates will help you through some of those tough times. But that's the hardest part is, you know, the inconsistency. Um, some guys do want to go up for that opportunity. And then there's other guys that like, no, I just want to stay here and, you know, play my games and build my resume, which is fine, yeah. you know, because next year is a long ways away. Um, you know, I had, one goalie went up last year, um, Chase Perry. He was up a lot, and he didn't play, didn't play. Then finally they threw him in. I think he got first star of the game and then released the next day. <laughs> brutal. Yeah. What, what Came a back, <laughs> was uh, with me for, I think, a couple weeks. Got called up again. Was there the rest of the year in uh, Newfoundland. Um didn't end up uh, going very well. They let him go the last weekend of the season, uh, the day after roster free, so he couldn't join another team. Which yeah, that kind of that was brutal for him. It's terrible timing. But um, you know that's the hard part is getting into a rhythm and getting your games in. Yeah, I got you. So I don't know. I mean, I feel like I've 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 talked to you, Hale. It's almost been an hour. We're at forty-eight minutes that we've been going. So I feel like I've, I've, I've stolen enough of your time, and and it's valuable because you, you, you got a whole team you got to organize in a short amount of time. So I'm going to let you go here, but I, I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, the Packers are going to go two and zero against the Bears this year. But uh, <laughs> here's my surprise face. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna end up eating my words every time I get cocky about anything. It backfires tremendously on oh, me. So <laughs> wearing this hat, that was their only win of the season. It's gonna be like a high school score this weekend, like seventy to fourteen, <laughs> something just ridiculous. It's gonna be like the way the Packers lost to the Vikings. It's just <laughs> so. gonna be a shellacking. <laughs> Uh, but but no, well, hopefully the hopefully the mayhem have a really good record this year, and I, I really do wish you good luck this year all season. I look forward to seeing the the new look team and and the changes that you're going to bring, and uh, and yeah, I mean that's really it. And once again, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And maybe later on this season, we can we could touch base again and and talk about how things are going. Awesome, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. You be safe. Yeah, you too.
All right. Well, there you go. The new head coach of the Make and Mayhem, Nick Niedert. I uh, I stole a lot of his time. I didn't realize that we'd been jabbering on, but the man's got so many stories. How do you how do you how do you not just sit there and listen? I mean, I th- I think uh, I think the players in Macon are are in for a treat there because he just he's been he's been through a lot as a player and his first year as a coach he was also through quite a bit i mean there was a lot of things going on in danville uh for the bobcats that were just just things a lot of things they couldn't control too that were just out of their hands and it was tough it was tough so speaking of the bobcats i uh I know I've gotten the new Knoxville coach on. Now I got the new Mayhem coach on. I'm working to get the new Bobcat coach on. So don't don't uh, don't think I'm ignoring you, Bobcat fans or anybody else that just wants to hear from the coach. I, uh, I said I'm working on it. I'm working on it. It's uh, the off season's a busy time for the coaches, especially right now, getting getting everything together, getting everything to go. I mean, October's right around the corner. We're in the middle of September right now, and it's it. It's it's moving fast. It seems like the first time the the first podcast back, you know, a couple of weeks back was was just yesterday. But uh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. And you guys know that because you're sitting there. You're going, why doesn't he release these every week anymore? I'm so mad at him. But I'm going to try. I'm going to try. We're getting closer. It's getting easier for me to get in touch with the teams and 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 players. And there's a lot of rosters that are getting set up. I'll look to see if I could get some players in there. There's. There's uh there's been some more more additions to rosters across the league. Uh, Peoria signed a few people the other day. Um, there's the the rosters are growing. The, the the teams are coming together. Training camps are going on. Quad City just had their free agent camp this past weekend, and I don't know the results of that. I don't know if they uh, who's who's getting welcomed on to the the uh, the main camp coming up, but. Things things are starting to move along. We we all need to get excited. It's hockey season. We're we're here. It's September, and it's, it's we're we're on the home stretch. And before you know it, we're all going to be back on the ice and, or back at the rink watching those guys out there on the ice. And it's I, I can't wait. I, I I hope you guys are as excited as I am because I think this season is going to be an awesome season. Last season was great. The, the bar was set high, like I mentioned earlier. I mean, it just seems like the competition was so well and it even went into the playoffs with roanoke dropping the one and the two seeds to make it to the finals when they had no business doing it according to the experts i don't know who the experts are but uh but i sure as heck didn't have them going to the finals i'll tell you that and but as you guys know i'm an idiot so i don't know it was uh I'm, the bar was set high i hope maybe uh i hope maybe there's not such a stretch this year in the bottom three teams you know the out of the playoff teams i hope it's a, a little more competitive i have noticed a lot of changes i mean as you guys know i i, I cover the bulls as well uh, and um i've noticed a lot of changes to that roster it's like almost a whole new philosophy coming to that team and um they're stealing players away from Knoxville. They got uh, they got the the Knoxville captain Stefan Bracado from last year is uh, going to be a bull this year. That was that was one that I don't think a lot of people seen coming. Just like Timo Feyev coming over there. So you're seeing some changes in 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 teams, and then you're seeing some teams stay the same. I mean, why should Peoria change hardly anything that they did last year? You know, Roanoke, as as I mentioned uh, earlier this off season, uh, Roanoke's captain Travis Armstrong announced his retirement. So they got some, they got some leadership roles to fill there. But Roanoke had, uh, they, I mean, they had that team mesh in there. So I imagine they're going to try to try to run it back with with a lot of the same guys. You'd imagine Knoxville's going to try to do some of that, but Knoxville's also, you know, new coaching staff. So it's going to be interesting to see how that goes just all the teams. I mean, and, and you, you know, you know, Huntsville's going to be ready. They're bringing a lot of guys back from last year. They were, they were awesome. Nolan Kaiser's not coming back though. He, uh, he changed the skates for, uh, for a suit and tie. He's a, he's a office man for the havoc now. And we'll see. Also, I, uh, I don't remember if I mentioned this before, but, uh, Fayetteville is, um, they lost, uh, God dang it. Why am I screwing this up? (laughs) <laughs> but uh all right this is dumb harrison harper there we go i had him on here i talked to the guy harrison harper is not gonna play hockey this year i don't know if uh if you guys 
knew that. I don't know if there was ever like an official announcement by anybody, but uh, you got to listen to his podcast too. And you can because it's not a hockey podcast, so it's not competing with mine. So I'm more than willing to let you guys listen to that one and tell you about it. It's called The Project. He cracks me up. He's a funny guy. I need to try to find a way to get him to come back on the podcast. Now that he's retired, it seems like retired players, you know, they got a little more that they're willing to say than the guys that were uh, that are playing right now. So that's it. I don't really want to sit here and ramble on forever and ever about nothing at all whatsoever. But um, like I said, I'm going to keep trying to get people. I'm not going to come on here and just speak nonsense to you. I will keep trying to bring you guests because it's just a bad show if I don't have somebody else for you guys to listen to, basically. But uh, we're going to see. Maybe we'll try to get uh, run it back again next week. If not, I'll see you guys soon. Don't worry. Um, this is coming more frequently, I promise. We're going to get this thing going. But for now, I will talk to you guys all later on. I hope you guys are all pumped and ready for the hockey season. I hope you loved the interview. Make sure you like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you go to our page if you're listening to this make sure you follow us on twitter make sure you follow i mean you look we got it all like i said make sure you're make sure you're following field pass hockey we are bigger and better than ever this season we got uh we're, we are your premier source for minor league hockey enough said until next time you've been listening to the inside the sphl podcast Got a topic you'd like discussed? Follow James on Twitter at FPH Bulls. For the latest news on the SPHL and the rest of minor league hockey, download the Field Pass Hockey app, now available in the Apple and Android app stores.